bush people on the bed of a pickup. That's not unusual in northern Namibia. But what is unusual is that the young bushwoman is married to the German behind the wheel, the hunter and farmer Arnold Huber. When I was still living in Germany, we went on holiday and always to Africa. And gradually, I had the desire to stay here for longer than two or three weeks. So I applied for a position as farm manager here. I then had the idea that my income would be significantly better as a professional hunter, and so I chose to do that. And that's where he found his true happiness. While hunting elephants, he found and married a bushwoman. My mother's to blame. She gave me an elephant instead of a teddy bear when I was little. And so it was my dream to become an elephant hunter in Africa one day. The elephant hunter became a farmer. Arnold Huber's wife, Kaza, rules the kitchen. She is one of the Kung bush people. When my wife met me, she didn't know how a light switch worked. For the first five or six years of her life, she grew up wild. She didn't have any Western influences at that time. The eldest daughter definitely has the biggest problem with the two cultures, because during the first five years, she grew up entirely in the bush, without contact to our world here. Edith, Naka Edith. Even though the German isn't sure he's properly mastered the click sounds, he wanted his children also to have a bush name like their mother. What's that for Tia? Okay, Ludwig. Since my wife is clearly more talented than me when it comes to languages, she now understands everything in German. And if I don't understand her bush language, she'll tell me in Afrikaans. In Kaza's kitchen, everyone speaks Khoi San. Her cousins, who are helping out around the house, can't speak any other language. Even though Kaza understands German, she can't help her children with their schoolwork, as she can neither read nor write. And so the German father has to check the reading exercises of his school starters himself at the weekends. I learned more from my wife in the first year than I learned in 13 years in school in Germany. What helped me was the behaviour of the bush people. It's not completely distorted by education. They do what they feel here, whereas we sometimes do what's expected of us, even though we don't feel that way at all. We're visiting Kaza's family clan. White people were not allowed on Kung land in the past, it was only in the 1980s that big game hunters were given hunting licenses here. We then hired people from this village as trackers. They helped us find elephants. Then men didn't come to our hunting camp alone. They brought their women and children and lived in our vicinity. That's how I met my wife. I chose her because she was the best dancer of them all. There was a group of five or six women, all of the same age, and they were all dancing. And there was food. We always had elephant meat. They felt comfortable around us, and so we started to get to know each other. By our standards, she may have been a bit young, but by her standards, it was high time she brought her husband home. But Arnold either doesn't know or won't say exactly how old Kaza was. She couldn't speak Afrikaans at the time and I couldn't speak Khoisan, but over time you find your way. 
Their relationship made the German an outsider amongst the white population. In the early 90s, there was the Bushman village here, and they gave me the chance to settle here with them. We built a small house. It was all wild at the time here. We were at the end of the world. After a few months, a village elder died and the village moved on. That meant we were alone here. And that was a problem because my wife had wanted to move with them. But I said I wasn't willing to build a new hut every six months with foundations and all sorts. I was working doing safaris and when I was gone, she locked everything up and moved to her family because she was scared of being alone. But later, when we had a child, she did stay here alone and came to sleep in the hut at night. And so Kaza became an outsider amongst the Kung. For one year now, Edith has been attending a private secondary school in Tsumeb, where she lives in a hostel. This weekend, she has to study at home for an English exam, but as an ambitious track and field athlete, she usually spends a lot of time on her sport. Now in the new school, I have a coach. He's a national coach and trains all the athletes who go to the Olympics. At one of those sporting events, at the 800 meters, I fell and stood up again and carried on running. And he saw me and said he'd take me on. But before track and field, the daughter of the professional hunter had practiced shooting. When I started going to the school and we came to the farm, I already hunted with my father. And at 10, I shot kudu, and they made a cut in me to show I was a hunter. But you can't see it anymore. They didn't cut deep enough. The hunter who still hunts today is just satisfying some primitive drive that's still in all of us to some extent. Of course, hunters have guns now and shoot animals, while photographers use cameras to get good pictures. The second time when I shot, I was shaking because I didn't want to shoot the animal anymore. Edith always wanted to be a German child. She has always denied her Kung origins a bit. When she was asked as a child what she was, she would say German. She was fortunate because she has become very fair. The other children are a bit darker. She would prefer to have hair like a German girl, not so curly and dark. She would like to dye it blonde and straighten it. 600 kilometers from Namibia's capital, Windhoek, life at Ochi Rukaku seems untroubled, particularly at the weekends. But as a farmer, the professional hunter has to fight for survival. Huber owns around 200 cattle, mainly bullocks for meat production. Seven hundred and fifty kilograms of living, breathing flesh throw up quite some dust, a Brahmin bull. At the weekends, Ludwig tries to perfect his driving style. Somewhat unusual for Europe, but on Namibian farms, the children learn to drive cars when they're tall enough to reach the pedals, and that's just as early as they learn to shoot. With around 2,000 hectares, Huber owns a small farm by Namibian standards. But Oji Rukaku is also a hunting farm. Arnold wouldn't be able to keep the farm from stock breeding alone, nor would he be able to pay for his three children's school fees. His safari company is his second pillar. Okay. 
the trophies of a hunter who was hunting with Arnold in a salt bath. When kudu, oryx or springbok are skinned, Arnold will lay the hide in salt to prevent it from rotting or losing its fur. Later, he will bring the hides and trophies to the taxidermist, who will tan them and process them according to the hunter's wishes. As a licensed hunting guide, Huber accompanies foreigners wanting trophies in Namibia, even though it's not always about elephant tusks. Ludwig, who has already shot his first kudu, is helping to clean the horns that will later adorn German living rooms. A beauty parlor for trophies. Not every taxidermist is able to process the animals in such a way that they look right afterwards. It's hard work and requires artistic input. The hunters here come from other countries and shoot animals, and we use the meat while they take the trophy home as a memento. That's exactly like taking a photograph. The hunters just take the hides home and hang them up, and whenever you see the animal, you're reminded of your experiences of the hunting safari of Namibia. That all comes back to life. This here is a female animal. And this is a bull. The female has slightly thinner horns and usually somewhat longer ones. It's the only species where we also hunt female animals when they're old and won't get pregnant anymore. Because both sexes make good trophies. The kudu is the absolute pinnacle when it comes to hunting in Namibia. They have the largest horns of all animals in Africa. And the shape is also magnificent, the way the tips turn outwards, for example. It's an ideal hunting trophy. We shoot 4,000 kudu a year and 300 eland in Namibia. That's a much rarer trophy. And it's more difficult to come by. Because it's more expensive, it doesn't make it onto the wish list so often either. The harder it is to get a specific trophy, the greater the satisfaction when you're successful. But not every hunt is successful. Alarm on the farm. A cobra has been sighted. <laughs> the morning flag ceremony at Kristallika Afrikaans Privat School, the private Afrikaans high school. Every morning we have to stand in line and are told about the issues of the day. Then we pray and then we go to our classrooms. The school fees are 6,000 euros a year. In the afternoon, we line up again and pray. Then we have a working hour from three until four. And then from four till five or half past five, we have sports. Amongst the 250 students, Edith is one of three non-whites. Bush people aren't very self-confident towards non-Bush people. That's the way they are. I don't know why. It's a bit of a problem we sometimes also have with our children. The little girl is a lot more extrovert and fits in more with our cultural circle than the other two. First steps into the world of numbers. 
a maths lesson with Rosie Giersch, the headmistress of the private German primary school in Hoetfontein, 25 kilometers from Huber's farm. The school only has 27 pupils. 11 of them live in the adjoining hostel during the week, including Ludwig and Sieglinde. Worried that the children aren't adequately challenged in the state schools, the parents founded the private school, which they have to pay for themselves. Zeig mir fünf Finger. Drei. So ist einfacher. A committee has to improve the finances with an annual prize draw and a cattle project. Arnold Huber is raising young oxen for sale. The profits then go to the upkeep of the school. The Kung only have the numbers 1, 2 and 3 in their own language. 5, 6, 7 are all many. Everything to do with numbers is meaningless to them. They don't keep time or know their age. When I came here, it was a small village, just like it is today. I brought mountains of meat home from the hunts, and that led many people to move here from the neighboring communities. And after a few years, this was the second largest place here after the regional capital, Tsumkwe. And at some point, the idea came up that a school was needed here. So we built one. When we moved away in 1999, it took less than a year for the village to shrink back to its former size. And then they closed the school again too. In the village, the bush people can now only survive with state support, which takes the form of a few sacks of maize meal once a month. That's why Arnold brings Kaza's closest relatives to the farm for a few months during their annual visit to the land of the Kung. A cattle auction in Kordfontein. Every two weeks up to 1,200 bullocks, cows and bulls from nearby farms are auctioned off here. Arnold wants to buy young bullocks. He's hoping the prices won't go too high. It could take hours before the animals Arnold wants are brought in. Among the interested buyers, there are also speculators and dealers who buy in bulk for big South African meat producers. Arnold's is the winning bid. Four generations around the fire pit. Edith, the bush girl who isn't just fluent in Khoisan, but also in Afrikaans, English and German. I get the feeling that our eldest daughter is keeping her distance from the bush people, more so than the little ones. For her, it was always a fairy tale world in her mind. And when she came back for the first time and saw all the privation, it was a big shock for her, and her fantasy world collapsed. The 40,000 surviving bush people in Namibia live on the fringe of society. Edith is being styled for a photo shoot. 
Is the 15-year-old girl who lost her fairy tale bush world looking for a new, a white dream world? Her father doesn't seem opposed to the idea of a career in the glitz and glamour world of fashion. Kaza has gone out with the women and girls to gather field fruits, like they used to in the Bushman land, but this time not on foot, but by jeep. At the time, they always had to walk long distances to gather the berries for the family, as she tells her daughter. This fruit is very sweet and it's our staple food. We have to gather a lot of them, so we have enough at home. The berries are very good. We drink the juice and spit out the pips. <laughs> From a very young age, the children know every plant in their territory. In the past, we were limited by laws and we weren't able to move about freely. But in this place, we can do everything we want to. <laughs> especially when married to a white man. I haven't noticed Edith valuing her education more highly than her mother's knowledge. Many Kung children who attend school feel superior to their uneducated parents because they've learned the three R's. But they have lost their knowledge of nature, which is their most important knowledge in the struggle for survival. <laughs> The Bushman's behaviour really resembles that of early humans. They aren't so far removed from that as we are. And so I think their behaviour towards their children is very instinctive. They don't have pity, which is something we all have, and they don't have self-pity either. <laughs> The old people aren't scared of death. When the time has come, they just die. Death is simply accepted. The women were only able to gather a few beetles. The beetle season is over already. Amongst the Kung, these insects, baked in ash, are considered a special delicacy. And even though Edith generally distances herself from the bush people and their traditions, she enjoys these well-salted snacks. There is no hierarchy in the life of the clans, and adults don't interfere in children's lives. Does it confuse Sieglinde, who generally enjoys a German style upbringing? <laughs> Arnold's children, the white bush children of a German hunter and farmer in Africa, seem to have the qualities and opportunities of both cultures. Ludwig and Sieglinde can move around in both worlds and they can already count beyond the Kung's one, two, three. And Ludwig, the sports enthusiast and footballer, stoically and proudly endures the ritual incisions that show he is now a hunter. Okay. <laughs> 
His father Arnold, a German who wants to maintain the Bushman traditions, is trying to bring the two souls and the two worlds into harmony. The Bushman culture is completely different from our world. It wasn't easy at first. We live in a world of arguments, and Bushmen have no arguments in their world. We all have to justify our behaviors and desires. Bushmen don't do that. The right way is probably somewhere in between. Oh, my God.